Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, when I go to court, right? Mm -hmm. Is it on? Mm -hmm. All right. Don't when I go to court, up. I always take all my lucky charms with me, and I was one of the fellows that served with the infamous Apache Troop, 1st Squadron, 9th Air Cavalry. Uh, we were the fellows that were in the movie Apocalypse Now, where they told you, I love the smell of napalm in the morning, and that gentleman was exactly, was exactly like that. Uh, this book is done about the, the Apache headhunters uh, by a Cobra gunship pilot by the name of Jerome Boyle, who we used to call uh, Dirty Harry, because he looked just like uh, Dirty Harry. Make my day. He used to have that uh, painted on the side of his aircraft along with Pinball Wizard and a few other things. Uh, this is a phenomenal book about a story of uh, serious Americans. Uh, this is a Cobra pilot, Jerry Boyle's own story, a former policeman arrived in Vietnam in March of 70. He went from being a FNG, which I can't tell you what that is in a church, but it's bad, to a combat vet in just two months, whether rescuing down crews, flying fiery combat missions during the invasion of Cambodia, or being shot down himself, Boyle saw war quickly turn from a scary game of bullets, rockets, and grenades to a terrifying race against death, where just split seconds could turn a scene of breathtaking beauty into one of stark, absolute terror. He witnessed men risk their lives daily to save others, and he heard the dreaded call, taking fire, taking fire. There were too often a fellow pilot's very last words before his chopper became an inferno. Boyle learned real fast that there weren't a lot of going-home parties for Apache troops pilots. And when you, you listen to some of the stuff, this is a Cobra pilot's life and death experiences in Vietnam's legendary Apache troop, first of the 9th Air Cavalry. This pilot was the recipient of, uh, he was a California native and former policeman of Ventura, California. Among the medals and decorations awarded to him for his service, and this was kind of typical of most of the people in this outfit. Silver star, three distinguished flying crosses, five bronze stars, two Army Commendation Medals for Valor. He now works as a pilot who flies in support of offshore operations. He lives in Andrea. He lives in uh, Oha, California with his wife Andrea of 20 years. And to read some of the stuff about this is absolutely phenomenal. Some of the things that get involved, I'll just read you the, the, a closing part of this thing to give you an idea. The Apache troop I served in wasn't part of the Army. The Army was part of Apache troop. We were Mavericks, but the kind of team that any commander with hair on his tailpipe would want his unit to be like. If you couldn't get what you needed to accomplish the mission through normal channels, we begged, borrowed, or stole it, usually the latter, with few exceptions. I'd follow the men of Apache Troop into hell, knowing full well, sooner or later, someone from the Blues, the Whites, the Reds, the Lift Platoon, or the Mess Section would emerge from a smoking hole, dragging the dead, smoldering ass of the devil. <laughs> now, he kind of exaggerates a little bit, but I can tell you that these men were phenomenal, phenomenal fighters, and it was my great privilege to serve with them, and when I go to court, I take all of my battle stuff, my, my ranger stuff, my first air cab, this is from the Apache Troop logo, there's my flight wings, the actual ones I wore, this is the first of the ninth logo that was put on the nose of all the aircraft, there's the first, there's first 75th Infantry Rangers, I have my uh, duty on our country uh, coin from the uh, MacArthur group of people. It's a special group of people that defend the Constitution. It's a silver coin that's given as a serious defender group memento. This is MacArthur and it's solid silver. Then I got all my Ranger jump stuff. I put that on there. I take my strike like lightning, sound like thunder, all my Ranger stuff that when I was in the Rangers and I take my first air cavalry when I was in Cambodia because I was with these boys in Cambodia and locked in. My Apache troop. <clears throat> That's right off of our shoulder patches from the Apache troop, the original one. I was with the Take My Detroit Judo Club. This is a patch they give you for running 50 miles to save your life. You got a certain time to do it in. They give you a boot lace and a pocket knife and if you get caught they put you in a POW camp and treat you like a prisoner. So it's like you got 12 hours to run 50 miles or, or you go to the POW compound and they treat you like uh, 
a POW. They hung my buddy up in a pit full of poisonous snakes upside down for about a day or two. <laughs> and then this is my other patches that I wear from, from Vietnam and Special Operations Group. I flew in support of Bogrites in Cambodia. We used to deliver their supplies. I got my my Ranger belt buckle. All these are mementos of a program, my Bronze Star Medal, my I have 33 of these air medals. I got five of these bronze stars. I got a distinguished flying cross, Vietnamese cross of gallantry, 33 air medals. Shot down four times, left for dead twice, walked out of Cambodia with two regiments on my tail feathers. This is the SOG Special Operations Group MACV that we flew in support of uh, Bogrites in Cambodia and the Cambodian operation. I was one of the special air crews that was selected personally to fly the infamous marine sniper in the Laos to shoot that general at 800 yards. I was one of the guys that flew him in. And we wear the wings of eagles. We support the National Rifle Association totally. You know, we ain't fooling around. We want our Constitution. We want our Second Amendment. I am a member of Vietnam Veterans. And basically, when I go to court, I put all my lucky charms in my pocket. It kind of drives them nuts down at the courthouse. I also have my flag. I always take my flag with me. And I have my Vietnam veterans belt buckles and my the uh, oppresso libre, which means the liberator of an oppression from the special forces that was given to me by the boys over there in, for helping them, you know. So all this goes in my my pockets. I go to court, my lucky charm, I call them, and it does, it's a little heavy, <laughs> but I, you know, it's like, when I go, I go for memory of those fine soldiers, and some of the things, yeah, I'd rather be killing communists, that's one of the models of the paratroopers from the Charlie Company Ranger Company. Charlie Company Rangers was the boys that supported that paratroop, that, uh, that marine sniper that shot him, we, that shot that general at 800 yards. So I'm a soldier, soldier. I've been a soldier, soldier. I believe in the things that the soldiers have done. I've seen a lot of good soldiers pay the maximum price. Um, I personally held them in my arms, and I listened to their last words. Tell my mother, tell my wife, tell my family I love them. And to me, the Constitution is a very serious document, and we defend it to the death. We do not fool around when it comes to the Constitution. I've been doing it for 25 years. I am a graduate of Project Blue Book, the special project. I also take my harmonica. I have a harmonica. Which drives What's the special uh, Project Blue Book? Blue Book is where they pull their soldiers aside and taught you the Constitution. And I always take my harmonica and I give them hell. Give them the... transport story. <clears throat> yeah, well, we uh, we were flying interdiction along the Cambodian border, and we come up on the door of these uh, B-model Huey. It was a smaller Huey, and it was uh, painted blue and silver. And uh, all along the side of the tail boom was white uh, powder. And uh, I informed the aircraft commander, and he told me, he was hailing them on the hailing frequency, and he called them up and told them to land. We wanted to inspect their cargo, and they told us basically to blank off and die. You know who we are? My pilot told him he didn't care if he was a man from GLAD. He was going to land that aircraft, and we were going to inspect his cargo. Basically, he told us, uh, <clears throat> we're not landing. My pilot ordered me to roll my guns up, and he shot them down. And we uh, went down there, and... We blew his landing gear off, shot up below his fuel cell, and uh, he got the idea we weren't fooling around. He went down and landed in the, in the rice paddy, and we inspected his cargo, and sure enough, he was carrying heroin. So the pilot gave him a choice. He could go to Long Bin Jail with us for contraband trafficking, or he, he could uh, hitchhike home, baby. So he chose to hitchhike home. Figured he had a chance. Of course, we knew that was going to be rather difficult in Cambodia, him being three foot taller than anything there walking. And a white man on top of that. But uh, we gave him a chance, and the bottom line is he didn't want to go to jail, so 
We uh, torched his aircraft and uh, we got back in the CO. Uh, are you crazy? <laughs> Those people are CIA. They're going to kill you. I told them, make my day. I said, uh, they were trafficking that dope to our GIs and uh, God knows who else. And as far as I'm concerned, we stuck it to them for about 15 million. And I'm just tickled. And if I could do it again tomorrow, I'd do it again. And that's a true story. We actually did it. So, anyway, to make a long story short, I'm a serious soldier. I love my country and its constitution, and I do not compromise when it comes to constitution. I defend to the death, and that's what we do. Not to get us off track, but how'd you feel about that piece they did on day one the other night on Bogue Rights? Uh, I thought it was kind of a little biased myself. They tried to paint him as somebody who's uh, setting up uh, another Waco, Texas, and. Uh, uh, that he was going to be one of these cultist type things, and uh, I, I didn't think they really played fair with the man. I, anybody who knows Bogarts, he's the most decorated soldier in the history of the United States. He's a very congenial gentleman. He, uh, when we worked with him in Cambodia, he was all business, all business, and uh, we flew his Fifth Special Forces people all over for whatever recon missions they had, and. Um, they got they got to work with us, and they know we were pretty serious folks, and. Uh, I personally think uh, Bo Greitz is uh, going to be painted as some desperado no matter what he does only because he is, uh, is uh, associated with the avant-garde type uh, constitutional defense. He was the guy that got the Ruby uh, Ridge uh, matter resolved peacefully. Uh, clearly he went in to, to save Randy Weaver because Randy Weaver used to be one of his boys on the team. And, uh, <clears throat> it took, I mean, he was risking his own life. They could have just as easily dispatched him, too. So he's a man of great courage. I respect, uh, what he's doing. I appreciate that, uh, he's trying to make things happen, but I also know that he's going to be held in some type of villainous, uh, no matter what he does, people are going to not understand, and they're going to be afraid. And, of course, the newspapers will continue to paint him as, uh, whatever boogeyman in the closet they can. All right, we're going to go on with our programming here. <clears throat> we just uh, got a little off the track there, just a little bit, just to kind of let you give an idea where we're coming from. We uh, we take a pretty serious attack on the Constitution, and we want to get into some other issues. <clears throat> we want to get into uh, things like things like money, 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 money. And one of the best tapes you can get is from a gentleman. Uh, we call him Ernie. Uh, he uh, basically is known throughout the movement around here. He delivers all the tapes and the what have you. And he has a tape called Wake Up America. And basically it starts telling you how money works and why it works and what they're doing with our money. And when you're done, you really understand what's going on. But we want to share some things with you about the money. And we got a good story to tell you too. But basically, we want to share with you right now in Michigan, the Michigan Compile Laws Programming. Can you see over there? We want to share with you up, up and to the left. All right, back. Okay. All right, we're cool. We're cool. All right. 21.153, Michigan Compile Laws Act. Obligations due state or municipality and date operative when paid by check or legal tender. Whenever any check or bank draft shall be tendered for the payment of any debt, taxes, or other obligation due the state or to any municipality therein, such check draft shall operate as a payment made on the date the check or draft was received and accepted by the receiving officer. If it shall be paid on the presentation without deduction for exchange or cost of collection, all agencies of the state of Michigan shall request that checks tendered in payment of an obligation due the state shall be made payable to the state of Michigan. No receiving officer shall be required to receive in payment of any debt, taxes, or other obligation collectible or receivable by him any tender other than gold or silver coin of the United States. The United States Treasury notes, which you can't get today, Gold certificates, which you can't get today. Silver certificates, which you can't get today. Or other Federal Reserve Bank notes. And there's no bank notes in circulation. There's Federal Reserve notes, but there's no Federal Reserve Bank notes. Now, the reality is, by this fact, you are specifically precluded 
from tendering lawfully without being a party to a felony that of debasement of the coin of the realm against the 1792 coinage act, the Sherman coinage act. So Roger Sherman wrote a book about this and it tells you all about coinage and the debasement of the coin of the realm. And that's why he is affiliated with the 1792 coinage act. Now the reality to this is what has been going on over a period of time is they've been playing games with the money. As we can see right here, we have right here a silver certificate. This certifies that there is on deposit in the Treasury of the United States one dollar, right, of silver. All right, one dollar in silver payable to the bearer on demand. Now, we had a little time we got together. We had some of these notes. We had some gold certificate notes. Also, we got one here that says, uh, we got one here that says uh, United States note, the United States of America. Now notice the difference here, folks. This one just says this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. But we know that that's a lie because Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution says nothing but gold and silver coin shall be made a tender in payment of debt. Now this is going to bring up a real interesting case that we got here. Now, we went down to the Federal Reserve Bank and we took $500 worth of, uh, these are silver certificates here, but we took gold certificates, $20 gold pieces. We had $500 worth and we went in the Federal Reserve Bank and I walked up to the window and I said, I'm the bearer on demand and lawful money of account of the United States government, sir. I said, I, I, said, I want my gold. I handed her the notes. She looked at me and she says, sir, we don't have any gold. I said, are you trying to tell me this bank is overextended? Everybody looks. You can't come in here and do that, sir. You're going to get a run on the bank. I said, I'm, I'm asking you for my gold. I'm the bearer. I'm here and before you demanding. It says pay to the bearer on the man and lawful money in the county of the United States government and $20 gold. I got $500 worth of these and I'll take $20 gold pieces. We don't have any gold. Are you trying to tell me this bank is overextended? So they called the SWAT team. This lieutenant comes running up and all these guys got rifles and they're all at port arms. And the lieutenant walks up to me and says, all right, what the hell is going on here? So I explained to him, I said, sir, I am the bearer on demand and lawful money of account of the United States government. I'm here and before this bank, this is a lawful bank of the government, and I'm asking you, I'm asking them to pay me, the bearer, on demand, my $20 in gold for every one of these $20 gold demand deposit uh, notes that I have, and I have up to $500 worth, and I just asked her for the gold. She told me she doesn't have any gold. I tried to tell her, you told me this bank's overextended, and she told me, you can't come in here and do that, and the next thing you know, you show up. The lieutenant looked at him and said, why don't you give the guy his gold? Come on, guys, we're out of here. So they left. They couldn't give me my gold, because they ain't got any gold. But there is a contract on here that says pay to the bearer on demand. Now, in this one, it's a dollar of silver. In theory, the contract is there, and you could, in theory, go collect it. But upon trying to collect it, there is no gold. There is no silver. They don't have any. Now, over a period, a long period of time in barter, we have slowly been pushed into a position of, of impossibility to perform. Now, can the hat check be the hat? Can you walk in and check your hat and get a hat check? And then when you come back to get your hat back, they hand you another hat check? Can you wear the hat check? Obviously not. So obviously the note is not the dollar. All it is is the promise to pay a dollar. Does everybody understand that? And what has happened over a long period of time in custom and uses is the people have been hoodwinked into thinking that they have money, dollars. There are no dollars. Dollar is a unit of measurement. Which brings up a very famous case, the case of Montgomery Warrens versus Eugene Glacier. For those of you who want to order the case, we'll be happy to give you the court case numbers. Let me take this off so it doesn't reflect too much. This is a very famous case, okay? The docket number is 82-002087. This is before the Honorable District Court of 52nd 3rd District Court. The judge of the record was the Honorable James P. Sheehy. Okay? Now, I'll give you a little synopsis of this case. What happened in this case... Did everybody get the court number first, though? 82-002087. All right, now, 
What happened in this case, to make a long story short, this gentleman's wife got a little mad at him, decided to take his credit card and go out and charge to Montgomery Wards from the front door to the back door, and he ran up quite a large sum of debt. The matter got, of course, Montgomery Wards wasn't going to take it back. You bought it, it's yours. You got it. Now, they went to court and uh, came up before the, the, the famous Judge James B. Sheehy of 52nd 3rd District Court, who, by the way, is a very excellent judge, very knowledgeable, very, very... A decent man, a kindly man. He's pretty serious business, though. If you're screwing around, he's going to hammer you. But most of the time, he's uh, quite congenial and kind of a lot of fun, too. But it came up before his court, and up jumped the devil in the deep blue sea, and they're starting to argue, and the judge is saying, well, let me ask you a question. He said, did you get a credit card? He said, yeah. So you signed for the credit card? He said, yeah. So you give the credit card to your wife? He said, yeah. He said, here's the bill. You pay. He says, okay, judge, now let me explain something to you. You told me that the judgment is for this amount. Is that right? And I'm asking you, and you told me it's this many dollars, and I'm asking you for a determination of the dollars. What, what dollars? He said, sir, you can interpret it any way you want. You can make it frankincense or myrrh. I don't care. I don't care if you don't even pay this judgment. I'll tell you what, don't pay it. There's a lot of documents in the basement, they never pay them says, don't pay it, we'll just take judgment against you and we'll attach it, you know, whatever we need for writs of attachment and we're going to collect on this debt. He said, sir, you misunderstand my point. Now, you you have told me uh, this amount of, of dollars and and I'm, I'm confused here. I need to know something about these dollars. He says, well, he said, let me clarify it for you. I've entered a judgment against you for the amount due, all right? He said, yes, sir, but if I ask you for a pound of something, you're going to say a pound of what? And if I ask you for a gallon of something, you're going to say a gallon of what? And if I ask you for a foot or a yard of something, you're going to say a foot or a yard of what? Now, you're coming to me and telling me dollars, and I'm asking you dollars of what? Because dollar is a unit of measurement. He said, you can make it anything you want. Tell you what, make it coffee beans. Now, at that instant, the Montgomery Wards attorney came to a half rise, and he went, Your Honor, Your Honor. There was 40 of us plus in the court, and we sat there, and all we could do was go, because <gasps> we realized instantly what this judge had just did. He had made a determination of the substance of the money of the county of the United States government pursuant to coffee beans. With great courage, the Honorable Judge James P. Shee had made a determination that the substance of the money of the county of the United States government was coffee beans. That's what we told the Wall Street Journal and all the newspapers and television stations that would listen. He was most upset about that. <laughs> Instantly, the judge looked across the room. We're all sitting with our jaw on the ground. <gasps> and he leaned back in his chair, flipped his pencil in the air, and he said, Ah, oh, ass with a hit, on the record. He realized that a landmark Michigan court decision had occurred. He realized that Montgomery Wards wasn't going to say nothing. Because they won. They, they ain't going to appeal. They won. They, what are they going to appeal? You won, you won. You won, you won. There's nothing to appeal. We weren't going to appeal because we won too. We got the judge to make a determination that the substance of the money of the county of the United States government was coffee beans. You can see in the back of this book here, Mr. Glacier took the judgment right here, and this was for 1,098.97. He did it in 100 bean bags certified, one bean to the dollar, and 97 one hundred. So we cut the tip of the bean off, painted a white line on it. He sent it to Montgomery Wards. We got it on there? Mm hmm. Please find enclosed in this package 1,148 coffee beans, which is payment in full, pursuant to Judge of the 52nd District Court, October 8, 1982, before His Honorable Judge James P. Shee. I thank you, sir, for your time and trouble concerning this matter. Most graciously, yours truly, Eugene Glacier. And it's certi certified mail sent to him. They never said nothing, nor would they, nor could they. He honored the stipulation of the judge, okay? Now, to this date, this gentleman comes to court with a big red bag, marble bag, full of coffee beans that he's got stenciled on the side, jeans, beans. I'll read you the last statement. This is kind of hilarious. It's pretty good. He's asking for a determination of the substance of the money of account. I'll read you about the last three pages. He goes, all right. <clears throat> Therefore, really, out of his own testimony, it seems to me that judgment really is unavoidable in that amount. Thank you, Your Honor, the court. Anything else, sir? You have the right to a closing argument, Mr. Glacier. Only that I don't think I received a fair and equitable trial here today, the court. 
This is a closing argument regarding this trial, okay? As to the subject matter, Mr. Glacier, subject matter, I have nothing to add to the subject matter here, the court. The court makes the following finding of facts, that the court finds that pursuant to plaintiff's exhibit number one, that Mr. Glacier, Eugene Glacier, entered into a contract with Montgomery Rewards and the company which it is a monthly account. Two, pursuant to plaintiff's exhibit number two, that the account was used by probably 95, 99% of the time of the purchases by his wife while they were married. Number three, that for testimony of Mr. Davidson's unrebutted testimony, Mr. Davidson, the balance owing on the account is $1,098.97. And the court also finds that Mr. Grossman, Mr. Grossman's, excuse me, from Mr. Glacier's testimony that he just recently got divorced, approximately August 24, 1981. And in that divorce proceeding, he accepted the liability to on this account as between he and his wife. Based upon the information, the court makes a conclusion of law that Mr. Eugene Glacier, the defendant, this matter owes Montgomery Ward $1,988.97. The court finds a judgment in favor of plaintiff in the amount of plus costs. Mr. Glacier. You have a right to appeal this, and that appeal, I think, is in 15 or 20 days, Mr. Grossman. Mr. Grossman, 20, Your Honor, 21, actually, out of County 23. I think it's 20 all over now, Your Honor, the court. I think it is. It used to be 15 on some cases and 20 on others, and I could never keep it straight. But I think it's 20. You have a right to appeal in 20 days. If you appeal, let me explain to you how you do that. You have the file with the court with a circuit claim of appeal. Are those the ones that are marked by the way those exhibits? Mr. Grossman, oh, yes, sir, Your Honor, that's right. The court. We better keep those. You can give him a copy of the other ones. By the, by the way, you, you can file a claim of appeal with the circuit court in this court. You also make a request to the court stenographer for a copy of the record. A copy of the record must file within a certain amount of time. Then you can tell you you must file, as I say, a claim of appeal, and then you have a certain number of days after that to file your appeal. Okay, claim of appeal is nothing more than a little form. I hereby claim appeal. Okay, so... But some, but the court clerks can give you more information. But if you don't file an appeal within 20 days, you've lost your right for an appeal. Any other questions before the court recesses? I'd still like to have a motion for a more definite statement. Dollars of what? Am I, do I owe the court dollars of what? The court. The court has made it. Now, this is, this is after he had already told him dollars of what before. And the judge told him frankincense and myrrh. And then he kept hammering away at this dollar, so what? And the court lost its cool. The court has made a judgment of $1,098.97. And however you interpret that, sir, if you want that in coffee beans, that's okay with me, really. Okay, thank you much. And at that point, we all went, oh. And he went, oh, S with a hit. <laughs> he realized he threw his pencil up in the air. Now, this is a magnificent case and an example. And to this day, this gentleman still pays court judgments with coffee beans. And if it's a viable case, you can use the case as a reference. Uh, it's a landmark Michigan court decision. We, we use it thoroughly. Okay? Now, to make a long story short, Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution is clear and specific. It says, Nothing but gold and silver coins shall be made a tender in payment of debt. We want to give a number out on where to get those tapes to... Uh, the tapes. It'll be on the end of the tape right at the beginning. Right yeah, okay. All right. We want to make sure they get the tapes about Wake Up America. All right. All right. Now, we got Article 1, Section 10 right here. For those of you who are looking for no bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. That's traffic tickets, folks. A bill of attainder is a traffic ticket. Can you see that right here? No bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless by the rule of apportionment or census to we'll, we'll talk about that later. That's another heavy one. All right. But Article 1, Section 10 is basically no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debt. Right here. No state shall enter into any treaty. Oh, wait, no, that's not right. Article 1, Section 10. Section 8. 10. It's Article 1, Section 10. No state shall make anything with silver coin. It's on the bottom of the page. All right, where's that? Oh, that's 9. That's fine. Article 1. No, oh, that is. It's towards the bottom of the page. Are they changing this thing? All right, here we go. All right, here we go. Here we go. Right here. 
No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation grant letters of mark and reprisal. A letter of mark or reprisal is like uh, your brothers messed with the king, so the king is going to attack your family and put a letter of mark out on them. Coin money. Emit bills of credit. What is a Federal Reserve note? Mm -hmm. Make anything but gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debts. Why? Because it creates inflation. you got to understand that paper money, if you can't redeem every piece of paper in a society, the amount that you can't redeem is inflation or credit. Credit is inflation, right? Pass any bill of attainder, huh? What is a bill of attainder? Again, a traffic ticket, ex post facto law, or law impairing the obligation of contracts or grant any title of nobility. When they give these guys these gun permits because they got $3,000 in their pocket and they're a rich businessman, isn't that a title of nobility? Because they get more rights. They're more politically correct than you. They have rights, you see. I mean, they violate so many things, it's not funny. It's never funny, but I'm just saying. I, I mean, you start reading this book, folks. I mean, I read it all the time, and I always find something new. This is kind of a book like the Bible. It's one of these books you can read and find something out of it all the time. The bottom line is you read the Constitution and you, you holler. You don't let these people jam your Constitution. You keep going. Now, we we also know, we wanted to share with the, uh, the program, the Brenton Woods Agreement Act, because we're on the subject of money. Where are we do that? We want, to, we want to get into the militia, too. We got the militia. All right. We want to bring into some of these arguments, okay? We want to bring in... Uh, I want the militia. I want the... Uh, uh, I want... Treason. Treason. Want to talk about that? All right, all right. Now let's let's talk about let's talk about treason here. Let's put this down here. What is treason? All right. Can you see that? Everybody see that? Title 18. This is this is the penal code, and we're talking about treason. Whoever owing allegiance to the United States levies war against them or adheres to their enemies giving them aid and comfort within the United States or elsewhere is guilty of treason and shall suffer death or shall be imprisoned not less than five years and or fine not less than a ten thousand dollars and shall be impeachable of holding any office under the United States all right after this section, it gives you all of the reasons of how you can be charged with treason. But the basic issues come under. Adheres to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. Now, breaking down the laws of our country has also been construed as giving the enemies aid and comfort. So if they're violating their oath of office and they're not upholding the Constitution, that is treason. Because in so doing, they create anarchy in the land. And in that, they aid the enemies of our country. Does that make legal sense to you? All right, now let's talk about some of the things that are going on in our country. <clears throat> let's talk about them. Let's talk about uh, where is that? I just had it here. What do we have here? We just had it here. We had it here. We want to talk about these treasonous acts, and we want to talk about things that are going on. This is the militia. All right. All right, here we go. We want to talk about Title 20, 22, United States Code, Section 286A. Basically, the part that we want to talk about is the, the governor's and executive director's term of office. But basically, when we get over here, we really want to talk about the compensation for services. And this is Title 22, United States Code, Section 286A. All right? Okay. Okay? 
Compensation for services. No person shall be entitled to receive any salary or other compensation from the United States. Did everybody get that? From the United States for services as a governor, executive director, counselor, alternate, or associate. The United States executive director of the fund. What are we talking about here? The International Monetary Fund. Shall not be compensated by the fund at a rate in excess of the rate provided for an individual occupying positions at level four of the executive schedule under section 5315 of title five United States code all right the United States alternative executive director to the fund what fund the International Monetary Fund shall not be compensated by the fund at a rate in excess of the rate provided for and individual occupying a position of level five of the executive schedule under section 5316 of title five united states code the secretary of the treasurer shall instruct the united states executive director of the fund to present to the funds executive board a comprehensive set of proposals consistent with the maintaining high levels of competence of the fund personnel and consistent with the articles of agreement with the objective of assuring that the salaries and or other compensations accorded fund employees who who fund international monetary fund do not exceed those received by persons filling similar levels of responsibility within the national government got me service or private industry the secretary shall report these proposals right together with any measures adopted by the funds executive board to the Congress prior to February 1, 1979. Now, folks, when they're talking about the fund, they're talking about the International Monetary Fund. And when they're talking about being paid, people like Janet Reno, who is a governor of the fund, is paid by the IMF. And who are they talking about? The Secretary of Treasury shall instruct who? Now, these people are paid by another government to our people. That is a violation of our laws. You understand? I mean, if they catch a congressman on the take, what happens? He's out of there. Why? Because it's considered to be unethical activity. Yet this foreign operating operating program, this International Monetary Fund, is paying our officers as executive officers. Who, whose interest do, you, do they serve? Do they serve the United States or do they serve the funds? Does that make sense to you? Okay. To me, this is an act of sedition or treason. The bottom line is they are not operating in the best interest of the United States of America. They are operating in their interest. And they are paid by a foreign power. And how can they sit in an office of government in the United States of America paid by a foreign power? It's inconceivable that this is going on. No. We want to find out. Who gets our income tax to the fund? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's absolutely obscene. Now, what we want to do here is I want to figure out... Uh, we got the treason, so we know that's treason. <laughs> I mean, if they're operating outside, they're in treason, right? Now, the next thing we want to get... We want to get... The we want to get the militia up here. Now, folks, the militia is organized because they have been concerned about our Constitution getting dumped in the, in the, in the can. Oh, also, we want to show them this. These concurrent resolutions here expressing the sense of the Congress regarding the need for the President to seek the Senator's advice and consent to ratification of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Okay. United Nations consent on the rights of the child. Okay? John Conyers is in on this. He's one of our guys, too. Okay? Now, the bottom line is they're setting standards, all right? And on these standards, whereas it is estimated that every night in the United States at least 100,000 children go to sleep homeless, whereas, I mean, they make all these allegations, wherein the United States has the world's largest gross national product, yet American children rank below the top 15 nations in regard to the health and well-being, whereas in 1989, the infant mortality rate for the United States ranked 19th in the world, being Singapore or Spain. I mean, they make all these allegations about the United States and the national 
Commission on Children has declared that every child in America needs an excellent education, yet approximately 40% of the nation's children are at risk of school failure. I mean, they go on and on. Whereas the United States, 2,600,000 children were reported to be abused and are neglected in 91. I mean, this is ridiculous. Whereas it's estimated that 1,800,000 teenagers were victims of violent crime. Whereas the Supreme Court has never fully articulated the range of rights to be accorded to children under the United States Constitution or fully articulated the manner in the Constitution is applicable to minors. It is. Whereas the positive futures of our families, communities, and nations are dependent. Now, they, you keep reading all these whereases. Whereas 29 others nations have signed convention indicating their intention to ratify the convention in the future. And then you get down. Whereas it is essential that the United States sign and ratify the Convention on Rights of the Child and begin implement of convention legal standards in order to improve and protect the lives of children. Believe me, they're not trying to protect the lives of children. They're trying to create a new federal bureaucracy. Whereas at the World Summit of Children in September such and such to sign the World Declaration of Survival, Protection, and Development of Children, which would include commitment to work and promote earliest possible ratification and implementation under the United Nations and Conventions of the Right of the Child. Whereas the House of Representatives passed a resolution during the 101st Congress urging the President to seek consent of the Senate to ratification of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. But such action having not occurred, it is necessary that the Congress implore the President to take action on the Convention now. And now they want to push it. All right. Now, you got to understand, folks, they're not doing this for the children, believe me. They're doing it because they want to create some new kind of problem. Children, tomorrow, I apologize to you on behalf of those in my time for the things we didn't do. We didn't stop the tyrants so your fate could be prevented. We watched them steal our freedom, but our silence we consented. We didn't choose to circumvent the doom you've not escaped, while the Bill of Rights was murdered and the Constitution raped. Some of us were lazy and too busy, others too afraid, to think about our children, the ones we have betrayed. We say we were too busy to be concerned or care, to try to ease the burden of the chains we've made you wear. A debt of 17 trillion, more money than exists, because we fail to heed God's call of usury resists. We could have been good shepherds when the wolf got in the fold, Yet watch the flame of freedom die, which leaves you in the cold. We changed our great republic, which was forged in blood for liberty, to a socialist welfare state, which we call democracy. I'm sorry we were so timid, betrayed by a selfish generation. We left yet a remnant of a free and prosperous nation. I'm sorry for our action like sheep we have behaved. We could have left you freedom instead you are enslaved children of tomorrow descendants of our land i'm sorry we allowed this fate you now must understand children of tomorrow educate yourself if by reading the bible of the bible to break the chains we left you with maintain god's ten commandments use reason logic and common sense suffer the little children to come to me for such is the kingdom of god dennis byron this come off of the Amateur Radio Freeman's Bulletin Board, August, September, 1992. End of transmission. So I think you can see here, at one time they pretend to do all this, and yet, <laughs> on the other, they do all that. So I thought this was very poignant uh, thing to put out on the air and try and hammer across, okay? Now we want to cover some other things. We want to cover the Brentwoods Agreement Act. We're trying to hustle up here. What do we got down there? Let's see. Hang loose here. That's what's up. I'll pull it. I'll find it. That's the treason statutes, the 22 USC. We want to go for. That's Erie Railroad versus Tonkin. That's the last thing I want to cover. United States. We got Marshall versus Kansas. We got uh, constitutional arguments. We got civil rights. We want to share so many arguments. Oh, yeah, we want to cover the 1 207. Remember, I told people about the 1 207? Right. We want to cover about the 1 207. Remember, I told you sign your name 1 207 UCC 1 207 without prejudice. This is it right here, folks. 
This is uh, the 1 207 Uniform Commercial Code. Can you get that? Okay. Got it? All right. This section provides machinery for the continuation of performance along the lines contemplated by the contract. What contract? The bankruptcy contract. Despite, that's in 1933, the pending, all right, pending dispute by adopting the mercantile device of going ahead with delivery acceptable acceptance or payment without prejudice under the protest, under reserve with reservation of all our rights and the like. All of, the, all of these phrases completely reserve all rights within the meaning of this section. This section therefore contemplates that limited as well as general reservations and acceptance by a party may be made subject to satisfaction of our purchaser subject to acceptance by our customer or the like. This section does not add any new requirement of language of reservation where not already required by law but merely provides a specific measure on which a party can rely as he makes or concurs in any interim adjustment in the course of performance. When they say performance they're talking about contractual performance it does not affect or impair the provisions of this act, such as those under which the buyers, right, remedies for defect survive acceptance without being expressly claimed. If notice of the defect is given within a reasonable time, nor does it disturb the policy of those cases which restrict the effect of a waiver of a defect to reasonable limits under the circumstances even though no such reservation is expressed. Now this is all what they're talking about when you write down without prejudice. They're telling you you have a right to reserve your right. So I'm telling you to use it. Don't screw around. Sufficiency of the reservation. Any expression. Can you see that? Any expression indicating an intention to preserve rights is sufficient, such as without prejudice, under protest, under reservation, with reservation of all our rights, under duress is another one. The code states an explicit reservation must be made. Explicit. Undoubtedly is used in place of express to indicate that the reservation must not only be expressed but it must also be clear under duress that such a reservation was intended in advance right the term explicit as used in UCC 1-207 means that which is so clearly stated or distinctly set forth that there is no doubt as to its meaning. Okay? Now that is the reservation I want you to claim. I want you to screw around. I want you to use your head for something other than a hat rack. Because I'm telling you. you just do it. Too. You just do it. Yeah, just do it. Yeah, you don't tell them nothing. You sign it and you walk out. When they ask you what that is, just say that's something I put down on my signature every time so I know it's me. Okay? You, you're not, you didn't learn all this stuff overnight, and you, you're not going to give somebody these classes overnight, believe me. If you think you're going to teach somebody this stuff all night, you're dreaming. It takes a long time of serious study to get to the level of where you're at, and you're not going <clears> to <throat> deliver that to anybody overnight. So my sincere advice is don't try and do it, because it ain't going to happen in your lifetime. Just sign it, do what you're supposed to do. If people want to listen, then you let them listen. If they don't want to listen, then you say, oh, well, I knew that. Okay? Now, let's go on here because i got a bunch of stuff to cover and we're running out of time. All right, what do we got here? All right, we want to cover the militia. There's a lot of people you're hearing talking about the militia. I want to get the Brenton Woods Agreement Act, too. 
if we can. Let me see here. I know we had it. Oh, Lord. <coughs> this is the hard part, keeping track of everything. Okay. Alright, we will find it. I promise you that. Alright, what we want to do... We want to show off some of these things. Under executive order of the President, all persons required to deliver on or before May 1st, 1933. Try and blow that up. That's a good one. That's all your gold and silver. I want to make sure we get into all kind of arguments here real quick. Like. Should we have some gold and silver? By law? Should we have some? Yes, set? yes. I think you should set aside some serious money to put in. I think people shouldn't have everything in gold and no. silver. Though. I think you should have... I think you should buy toilet paper, and I think you should buy food, and I think you should buy cough medicine, and I think you should buy laundry soap, and I think you should buy, you know, have some stuff around like you would keep your normal business and put a little bit in gold and silver. I think you should have a pump shotgun in your closet to defend your house. Something, yeah, something to defend your house. Not that you may need it, but if you do, you got it. I think you ought to seriously consider... All right, we got the militia here. That's one of the next biggies we want to talk about, the militia. All right, let's do that. I'll bring that Bretton Woods Agreement Act in yet. But that's also serious business. Oh, here we go, here we go. That is good. Here we go. Now, here we go, folks. This is the Bretton Woods Agreement Act. And this is the Agreement Act that, that created this problem with this Title 22 United States Code Section 286. Okay. This is heavy duty, folks, so uh, remember I showed you about treason. Okay. No person shall be entitled to receive any salary or other compensation from the United States for services as a government executive director, counselor, alternate, or, or associate, right? Congress, by law, authorizes such action. Neither the president nor any person or agency shall, on behalf of the United States, request or consent to any change in the quota of the United States under Article 3, Section 2, the Articles of Agreement of the Fund, the Fund, the International Monetary Fund. All right, let's pull it up here. All right, they're talking about dollar under Paragraph 6. Okay, that's not what I want. I want... Let's see, make any loan to the fund or bank, approve the establishment of any additional trust fund for the special benefit of the single member or of a particular segment of membership of the fund. Now, all right, let's see, in order to carry out the purposes of the decisions of January 1962 of the executive directors of the International Monetary Fund. The Secretary of the Treasury is authorized to make loans not to exceed two, looks like billion, yep, outstanding at any one time to the fund, if it sounds like I'm hammering on that fund, that's because I am, under Article 7, Section 1, subparagraph I of the Articles of Agreement of the Fund, I mean, they set this thing up. The Secretary of the Treasury, with the approval of the President, directly or through such agencies as he may designate, is authorized for the account of the fund established in this section to deal in gold and foreign exchange and such other instruments of credit and or securities as he may deem necessary to the consistent, constituent, or no, consistent, and consistent with the United States obligations in the International Monetary Fund. The Secretary of the Treasury shall annually make a report on the operation of the fund to the President and to the Congress. That makes the Secretary of the Treasury what? An officer of the fund. Okay. The Secretary of Treasury, yeah, he is guilty. The Secretary of Treasury is authorized to issue gold certificates in such form and in such denomination as he may determine against any gold held by the United States Treasury. The amount of gold certificates issued and or outstanding shall at no time exceed the value at the legal standard provided in Section 2 of Par Value Modification Act 31, United States Code 449, on the date of enactment of this amendment of the gold so held against gold certificates. They're in the gold certificates. 
All right. The amendment made by sections 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 of this act shall become effective upon entry into the force of the amendments approved in the resolution number 31-4 of the Board of Governors of the Fund. Now, this is called the Brentwood's Agreement Act, folks. And this is what set up Title 22, United States Code, Section 286A, which says that these officers are paid out of the fund. They're not paid as United States employees. Capiche? Is there any doubt in your mind now who gets paid where? They oh. don't. We don't pay them. They're paid by somebody else, the fund. Who is the fund? All of those rich guys that are sitting over in Europe that are trying to control our country. All right, now, okay, let's move on here. we got things to do. I want to show you something else, too. Let's look at the very first book of Title to of the United States Codes Annotated. And I don't care which section you grab. Grab either uh, Lawyer's Edition or if you grab... Uh, I want you to take a particular note to this and pay close attention. I want this amplified if you can do it. I want it to read right here. The part where it says, This title has been enacted into positive law. Notice the little asterisk right here, folks. There's a little asterisk right here. Everybody see that? Can you see that? You see my pen? Move it till you see my pen point come in. You see my pen point? All right, all right. This title has been acted in as positive law. Okay? Notice the little asterisk. When you come down here, and all these titles that got the little asterisk, they're all part of the law. Title 11 bankruptcy, Title 13 census, Title 14 Coast Guard, you know, copyrights, you got crimes and criminal procedure, Title 18, right? Now, I want you to notice something as we come over to Title 26 here. So, uh, title 26 is the Internal Revenue Code. It's never been enacted into law. It's a regulation. Can you get it? Can you get it? Mm -hmm. See that? Look closely, Title 26 and Title 27. Do you see an asterisk there? You don't see one, do you? No, sir. <coughs> That's because there ain't one. <coughs> now, let's look at the other version. The other version is exactly the same. This, this is the one out of the official U.S. reports for titles. And this one says, can you get my pen? You tell me when. Okay. This title has been enacted as law. Look at all the titles that got an asterisk. You'll notice again. Title 26 and Title 27, Zippo. No asterisk. Everybody see that? Real clear? Pull it over. No asterisk. Obviously, it's never been enacted as law. How could it be? I'll tell you how. We got a case over here called Erie Railroad versus Tompkins, and I'm going to bring it to your attention. Erie Railroad versus Tompkins is a magnificent court case. Basically, what this court case did. This court case is recorded at volume 304, United States Reports, section, or page 64 is the start of the case. That's 304, volume 304, United States Reports, section 604. Now, what this case does is it sets up a duality of citizenship. There are the citizens that live at the common law, and there are the citizens that live at the national law, or what is called Admiralty and Maritime Jurisdiction. Now, the way they get away with putting this Title 26 and this Title 27 out the way they do it, is they create this Admiralty and Maritime Jurisdiction, and if you volunteer into it, you are in it. If you step in it, it's on you. Okay? So I'm telling you, don't do that. You know what the doctor says. Every time you go to the doctor, and you say, Doc, every time I do this, it hurts. You know what the doctor tells you? He says, don't do that no more. You don't do that no more, it won't hurt, right? I'm telling you the same thing applies with this. Don't volunteer. How do you volunteer? You enter and you watch what you sign, number one. Any evidences of contracts where you are in Admiralty or Maritime Jurisdiction says that you are a party to the contract. So you avoid that. When you sign that bank draft to get into that bank and that Section 9 form you fill out, guess what? Look at the bottom. You sign to get into an Admiralty Maritime Jurisdiction. What the hell would you want to do that for? It's illogical. <clears throat> when you signed up for that Social Security check. So, <clears throat> how are we going to remedy this situation? 1-207, without prejudice. You sign anything that has to do anything with those guys, take the rights if they'll give them to you. Take the benefits. But make sure when you sign it, you sign it UD, 
1-207 without prejudice. And that makes you a common law citizen. And when they pull you into these courts and they claim they have jurisdiction over you, you say, the first thing out of your mouth is, Your Honor, may it please the court, before this matter goes forward, I wish to state that I am here on a special appearance as distinguished from a general appearance, and I am answering in the form of a demur. A demur is an old way of pleading. It's an old-fashioned, old-country, barrister, English way of pleading without granting jurisdiction. In other words, I'll answer out of courtesy, and I'll give you an answer out of courtesy, but at no time am I granting jurisdiction. Now, I put on my briefs. I state my name. I state the defendant, in propria persona, on a special appearance is distinguished from a general appearance for jurisdictional challenges. Now, I've raised the issue of jurisdictional challenges. I'm putting on the record. It's clearly cognizant. Once jurisdiction is raised, the, the burden is on the plaintiff to prove jurisdiction pursuant to uh, McNutt versus General Motors Acceptance Corporation recorded at 56 Supreme Court 502. It says, jurisdiction may never be assumed, but must be substantively proven by the plaintiff claimant. They don't prove it in a timely fashion, latches and curs. Latches is a species of action or in a party of reasonable intelligence and integrity, having a right to take an action as is prescribed by law, and having failed to timely do so, loses all right to proceed. So if they don't prove it timely, motion to dismiss, Your Honor, failure to state a cause of action for which relief can be granted, and I'd kind of like to collect my costs and fees for having to defend this frivolous case. Does that make sense to you? All right, now, let's get into this. Erie Railroad case. This is a railroad case. What it's about is a guy is walking down the track and a board was hanging off the end of the train and whacked him upside the head. He tried to sue in the state courts. The state courts uh, hammered him. So what happened was Erie Railroad had flipped around and they tried to sue him in the federal courts to get back at him. And they thought they were pulling a fast one. And what happened was the case bounced back on them. And guess what? When it bounced back, it created a very, very dangerous thing. Now, before this, I want you to understand that for 100 years of law, this case was the one that, that was the leading case before this. And this was called McCulloch versus Maryland, the state of Maryland. This is a very leading case. This is the most heavy case. It comes in two sections. That's the tell you how thick it is. So you're going to be reading for a while. This case upheld for 100 plus years, practically almost 100 years. This case is recorded at, <clears throat> uh, where are we at here? Where is the site? The site is, uh, uh, come on, give me a break. It's page 316. What is the volume? You guys are messing with me. You see a volume in there? Well, let's see what they call out here. They call up the beginning of the case. Well, we'll get you the volume. I should know it by heart, but I don't. Let's see if we can get it. It's an 1819 case. It is an old case. And it upheld for years the uh, single citizenship relationship. And it deals with uh, corporations. The power of establishing a corporation is not a distinct sovereign power or end of government, but only the means of carrying into effect other powers which are sovereign. Whenever it becomes an appropriate means of exercising any of the powers given by the Constitution to the government of the United Union, it may be exercised by that government. Now, basically, it sets up relationships. The Bank of the United States has constitutionally a right to establish its branches or other offices in dis discount and deposit within any state. All right? The state within which such branch may be established cannot, without violating the Constitution, tax that branch. All right? Now, it goes into some heavy arguments on taxes and some other arguments on, on, on programming, but I'm telling you here, this was the law of the land. I want to get a site on this uh, for a, uh, a reference. This book was so old when we got it from it should say what volume it is, but it doesn't. Normally they put it in the case and then they'll cite it one time and then they'll say everything after that, supra. They stated it at the beginning. All right. Volume four. Volume four. No, oh, wait. That's not really a good... That's probably... See, these reporters in the early... This is 1819, folks. That's when this case came down. So this was going to be, you know, shortly after the Constitution was signed. <laughs> 1791 is when the Constitution was signed, so it's going to be an early case. All right, William McCullough, defendant, blow in your branch. Normally they state the case one place, and they state it. 
But anyway, to make a long story short, McCulloch versus Maryland is a very heavy case. It was the law of the land, and it was replaced by Erie Railroad versus Tompkins. There is no federal, can you see that? There is no federal general common law. Congress has no power to declare substantive rules of common law applicable in a state, whether they be local in their nature or general, whether they be commercial law or in part of the law of torts. And no clause in the Constitution purports to confer such a power upon the federal courts, except in the matters governed by the federal Constitution or by acts of Congress. The law to be applied in any case is the law of the state. Got me? And whether the law of the state shall be declared by its legislature in a statute or by its highest court in a decision, not a matter of federal concern. Now, in disapproving the doctrine of the Swift versus Tyson, the court does not hold unconstitutional Section 34 of the Federal Judiciary Act of 1789 or any other act of Congress. It mere Title 26. Huh? It merely declares that by applying the doctrine of that case rights which are reserved by the Constitution to the several states have been invaded. Invaded. That's why they can get away with having Title 26 without having no asterisk. They don't have to have it in law. They're claiming it's an act of Congress. And if you voluntarily enter into it, guess what? You bought the whole firm. A federal court exercising jurisdiction over such a case on the ground of diversity of citizenship. What am I talking about? Diversity of citizenship. I'm talking about dual citizenship. Right? Is not free to treat this question as one of so-called general law but must apply the state law as declared by the highest state court. Swift versus Tennyson, overruled. The liability of the railroad company for the injury caused by negligent operation of its train to its pedestrian on a much-used beaten path on its right-of-way interstate, right, along and near the rails depends in the absence of a federal or state statute upon the unwritten law of the state where the accident occurred. Now what they're trying to do here is they're trying to justify the existence of this duality of citizenship between common law citizen, which you are, most of you, and this natural national citizen, which would fall under Title 26 United States Code. But I'm telling you to look up Section 6331A of Title 26, and you will see that the Treasurer, the Secretary of Treasury, has jurisdiction only over corporations, officers of corporations, and officers of government residing in the District of Columbia and artificial corporation, who are contractors of the fund. Capiche? All right. Now this is an important case. If you guys are going to be in this seriously battling and want to argue jurisdiction, which is a very good defense on almost anything they can pull on you. You're going to have to read these cases. Erie Railroad versus Tompkins, recorded at 304. That's volume 304, U.S., page 64 is where it starts. It's vital that you understand these arguments. I just finished battling a United States attorney, and we were arguing, and he's talking about, this is all gibberish. And I told him, I said, sir, I don't think you're well read on the law. All you got to do is read several of these cases and they'll tell you, one, there is a duality of citizenship. Two, it has to be clearly defined. And three, I have defined it. And now I'm asking you to prove that I'm not a party. Or prove that I am a party. You tell me. It's your burden. You're the one making the complaint. You make the complaint, you get the burden of proof. Who says so? McNutt vs. General Motors Acceptance Corporation, 56 Supreme Court, Section 5, or page 502. You made it, you prove it. Okay? You don't prove it timely, I motion to dismiss. Fair state of cause of action for which relief can be granted, and I will beat your little tail. So I would highly recommend you get to busy to prove it. Now, and if you think the stuff don't work, let me tell you something here. Right here, right today, Government came, told me, motion to dismiss, right? United States of America hereby moves pursuant to federal rules of criminal procedure for leave to dismiss the indictment in the case for the statutes, okay? Now, they can't argue. 
Give me a certificate of service. Order dismissing indictment, which the judge will sign. The government having moved to dismiss the indictment in the case of this court being fully advised in the premise that it is ordered in the indictment of B and the hereby is dismissed with prejudice and that the defendant's bond is canceled it is so ordered and adjudged. Wherefore, the United States requests that this court enter the attached order dismissing the indictment without prejudice, but we'll figure that out. We'll fix that up. See, I don't care if we go to court because I know who's going to win. And I pray to God that he'll help me do that. So if they want to go to court, I tell them, make my day. When I'm in the court, the guy says to me, well, we could get you for an income tax evasion. And you might win one, but you won't win them all. I looked at him most calmly, and I said to him in the clearest and gracious language, I said, sir, I'm going to advise you to go look in them law books real carefully, because I'm going to tell you straight arrow, I have had occasion to look in them law books. And I'm telling you, sir, if you bring that complaint against me, I'm going to tell you to make my day. Because I'm a pretty serious fellow, and I'm not going to fool with you. I'll sue your socks off and attach everything you own, bank, business, and home. So the best thing I can tell you is before you make a complaint, sir, I would highly recommend that you seriously consider the merits of your facts before you go writing a bunch of dribble. And when we got him today, he's talking about, well, your briefs are nothing but gibberish. So we asked him, he said, well, on our proposed order to have it dismissed, do you want us to put it down there for uh, good gibberish shown or just generally good cause shown? So he got a little red in the face and stormed out. But the bottom line is, if you know your facts and you got your stuff together, I'm telling you people out there in TV land, you can do this stuff. I, I, as God is my judge, I, I'm a truck driver. I'm a, I've been an engineer for a while. I've, uh, I'm a fisherman, a hunter, and a guide. Uh, I, I'm a regular person. I just read a lot. Okay. I know people like to add stuff in the game, but I, I'm a regular citizen of the United States. I love my country and its constitution. And uh, I'm not fooling around. I want them to honor my Constitution, and I don't think that's too much to ask. I think a lot of fine soldiers paid for it. We've had a lot of patriots. Some of the finest people I've ever known have paid for it. Uh, I especially uh, tout uh, Donald Costa, who was the uh, editor of the Constitutionalist newspaper and. Uh, He's the initiator and starter of the uh, Justice Prose movement in this area. Uh, he was a great man. He was a courageous man. Uh, he was found shot to death in his home with a bullet in his nose because obviously he stuck his nose in places it shouldn't have ought to been. He was a tireless defender of the people and the Constitution. Many a time we uh, cruised the countryside uh, doing meetings hither and yon. He wore a white cowboy hat, which we used to joke about. Good guys wear white hats. Uh, he was a, an exceptional personality. He lost everything he owned, fighting to the death. And uh, I, I, uh, I especially offer my, my serious prayers for his soul and for the soul of all patriots who have suffered tremendous things to uh, put on this constitution and to keep us going. Uh, the people with the WWCR radio there, uh, God bless you. Uh, radio Free America, Tom Ballantyne, uh, Bill Cooper, uh, the infamous uh, Jack McLam from uh, Vampire Killer 2000. The, uh, there's a uh, so serious, serious battlers out here, folks, uh, myself included. There's quite a few patriots all around. Um, I can't tell you the names of the people that I feel absolutely privileged to know because the list would be so long here it would take another two hours just for the tape. But I can tell you some exceptional people, and some of them are on bond and they can't be doing that, so, <laughs> so I, I'm respecting their... You know, some of the things, the infamous Eugene May, E.J. May. Uh, there's just so many. The infamous No Tax Jim, James Gordon Lott. Uh, I mean, the names are endless. Um, so I'm telling you folks out here, there's a lot of good people out here that are pulling for you, that have risked a whole lot, have gone to jail, have stood out, 
rain protesting. <laughs> The infamous Dave Franklin, who was one of the most leading arguers on constitutional issues of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. Uh, the outstanding uh, Art Morris, who published the book uh, uh, The Greatest Swindle Ever Told, which is about 4,000 pages of documentary evidence on income tax uh, situations. Uh, we're going to share you a couple of arguments in the end, and then we're going to kind of close it off here uh, until the next time. But... Uh, I, I want to thank you very much for inviting me into your home, and uh, hopefully we haven't bored you to tears, and at the same time you will have a new uh, love of your constitution and your country, and that you will uh, push like hell to make sure these people understand, hey, this is America, pal. Last time I checked, there's a flag on a pole out there, and that's an American flag. We don't want no blue flag out there. We want that American flag out there. And we got a constitution, and we're going to keep it. And if you don't like it, move. Preferably someplace out of here, like Russia or other places. If you like that kind of government, go for it. Knock yourself out. That's what that's what free America is all about. You got a right to any idea you like, just so you don't injure your neighbor. You got a right to free speech, but you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Got me? Does that make sense? Okay. So if you don't like it here, move. You want? You don't want to? Exercise your constitutional rights, that's your prerogative, but if you get abused, don't say we didn't tell you. Because uh, God kind of wants us to do this thing, because this is, this is his holy land, and he's hoping that we're going to have enough hair on our tail feather to do it. Now, I want to get into a couple other arguments. One of the things I want to tell you about is procedure. If you're going to go to court and you're going to be your own attorney, by the way, this is the infamous no tax Jim. He just died, God rest his soul. The infamous James Gordon Lott. I helped the gentleman do his appeal briefs to the U.S. Supreme Court, and I can tell you he was one hell of a gentleman. He can quote Tragedy and Hope, Quigley's Tragedy and Hope, from uh, from the hip, from memory. And he just passed away. Just recently he died. I want you to see how he died, too. Where is it? it says, He was alone when he died, Monday and no services planned, and they cremated his body. He fought to the end. To his last day, he was on the Mark Scott program. There's another exceptional patriot, Mark Scott. I, I can't speak highly enough for the courage it takes to come on the radio and tell God's truth. Uh, and there's a lot of people like him. Tommy McIntyre, uh, Mike Reagan. Uh, we could get you a list a mile long. There's patriots that come on and tell it like it is. J.P. McCarthy is another one that gets on there and tells it like it is. And I remember this one casual time he got Gus Hall on, and J.P. said to Gus Hall, he says, Gus, don't you get tired of losing? Because Gus was running for president on the Communist Party ticket. And Gus turned to him and he said, J.P., what makes you think we're losing? He said, we've implemented every plank of the Communist Manifesto. We just haven't got the guns from the people yet. And J.P. turned to him and said, yeah, and you ain't going to get them from the people. What do you think of that? <laughs> Well, folks, what do you think of that? They're working on it, aren't they? Huh? Now, you're going to go to court and you're going to be your own attorney. you got to be sharp. you got to keep records. You go to court, you write it down. You get anything in paperwork, you write it down. You send them anything in paperwork, you write it down. You got me? You don't be screwing around on me because I'm going to tell you some of these things got dates and times and things that you got to do. And if you don't take care of business, guess what? They ain't going to take care of it for you. You're your own attorney. If you want, if you want to be your own attorney, you got to have records. You got to keep on top of things. So every time you do something, you write it down, and you make sure you can go back and say, "Yeah, I remember on such and such a date at such and such a time this happened, and this happened, and this happened." You can construct a chronological order of events. Okay. <clears throat> now, also write down all important numbers to anybody that has anything that's got to be done. Okay, now, what we want to get into is we want to get into some serious arguments on uh, taxes. Okay. Well, also, we should tell you that if anybody violates your rights, okay, Title 42, United States Code, Section 1983. Everybody got this? Can you see it? Every person who, under color of statute, ordinance, or regulation, 
customer usage of any state or territory or the District of Columbia subjects or causes to be subjected to any citizen of the United States or other person within the jurisdiction thereof to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution and the laws shall be liable to the party injured in an action at law, suit, inequity, or other proper proceeding for the redress. For the purpose of this section, any act of Congress applicable exclusively to the District of Columbia. Why do you think they said that? Because they're members of the fund. And they are, they are under Title 26, Section 6331A. Shall be considered to be a statute of the District of Columbia. Now, does everybody understand about admiralty and maritime jurisdiction? I know you don't, but not. Not a little bit. They have created a duality of citizenship under the 14th Amendment. They're claiming there's common law rights, which everybody gets their constitution, and there's national rights where you waive all your constitution. Now, which did you want? Does that sound like a good deal? Sounds like you're being ripped to me. We got the 1-207. Remember, 1-207, right? All right, now. Okay. Where are we at here? We want to show Jack McClam's magnificent books, too. Vampire Killer 2000 and the Aid and Abet Newsletter. We need to get these out to every police officer in the United States of America. They need to understand what the heck's going on here. You get a hold of Jack McLam and his people at Vampire Killer 2000, and they will be happy to put this book out. This explains to your police officers exactly what the heck's going on. And they have an Aid and Abet newsletter that you can get. Let's get that out, Aid and Abet. Aid and Abet police newsletter, P.O. Box 8787, Phoenix, Arizona, 85066, right? And he has a phone number you can call him, too, I think. Now, they have these vampire killers out, and it tells the police everything they need to know. Also, they publish a newsletter, Aid and Abet newsletter. You want to make sure, Aid and Abet, okay? And get that to your police officers. I have, what I like to do is when a police officer busts me for something, what I like to do is I like to enroll him in a free subscription. And you know what? He hands it out to everybody. Plus, I'm doing him a service. Now, if you folks don't think this is serious, I'm telling you right now, they are building these work camps, these multi-jurisdictional forces, and these work camps all over. Notice that most of them are coordinated between Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and Wisconsin. And then they got a bunch more out here in the uh, Wyoming, Idaho, Great West. the Great West, and they got them in California. Then they got these detention facilities. Everybody paying attention to these detention facilities? Notice where most of them are, and what they call them is regional prisons. Look at all the ones here in Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio, or Illinois. There's a bunch of new ones sometimes. Yeah, there is. I know, I know, I know there is. They prop up and they call themselves... Okay, and then they got battle groups, United Nations battle groups. I mean, we've had reports of Russian troops being in Michigan all summer. And we got positive sightings by people that are retired military colonels and above. And we know they were at Camp Grayling this summer. So I'm telling you folks, the time to wake up is now. Wake up, America, before it's too late. Before you lose your God-given rights to some foreign potentate. You might think that you, uh, you look like a sucker. I mean, you want to buy any apples off that cart? I ain't buying no apples off that cart, because I know they're all rotten, okay? Now, we want to get into, um... Militia? The next thing we want to get into is the militia, right? And then we want to get into taxes, seriously. And that'll be the close for today. Now, those of you who have been in militia groups and everybody's getting all panicky, <clears throat> let's understand a few things about the militia. Whether you like it or not, you are in the militia in the state of Michigan. And I will tell you right where it says that. Article 17, militia, right here. What does it say? And this is from the 1850 Constitution. All the way back in our state to the Northwest Territories they, treaty, they have a militia. 
but this is an example of what they're talking about. The militia shall be composed of all able-bodied male citizens between the ages of 18 and 45 years, except such as are exempted by laws of the United States and of the state, but all such citizens of any religious denomination, whatever, who from scruples of conscience, all right, in other words, if you're a conscientious objector, may be adverse to bearing arms, shall be excused therefrom upon such conditions as shall be prescribed by law, and they have con conscientious object objector status, okay? Then you go to the 1908 Constitution, just to show you that this is the God's truth here. 1908 Michigan Constitution. The Michigan militia shall be composed of all able-bodied male citizens between the ages of 18 and 45 years of age, except such as are exempted by laws of the United States or of this state. But all such citizens of any religious denomination who, from scruples of conscience, may be adverse to bearing arms, shall be excused therefrom upon such conditions as shall be prescribed by law. Okay? Now, that's the 1908 Constitution. Now, you come up here, and this just lets you know the trend. The trend here. Now, we're in the uh, 1963 Constitution. And in the 1963 Constitution... Oh, I wanted to show you a little diverse thing here. This right here. Common law and statutes and continuance in Michigan. The common law and the statute laws now in force, not repugnant to this Constitution, shall remain in force until they expire by their own limitations or are changed, amended, or repealed. So the common law is prevailing. The militia, here we go. I knew we'd seen it. Now notice, folks, <laughs> As the, as, the thing, as the thing goes on, it gets shorter and shorter. Here's your militia. This is Article 3, Section 4. The militia shall be organized, equipped, and disciplined as provided by law. That's all you get now. Now, when you look in the beginning of this Constitution, there is an there is a, a empowering statutory uh, phrase that says, all constitutions before, everything they had in them are carried forward to this Constitution. And that's how they're allowed to do this. So what would happen in this case, because they haven't clearly defined it here, they would have to go back in the law to the previous Constitution, which would be the 1908 Constitution, which we just read to you. So this one right here. So this one would be the militia shall be composed of all able-bodied male citizens, 18 to 45 years of age. So that would be the controlling one, because that's as prescribed by law, just like they said. Does everybody see that? Now, the bottom line here, folks, is... A lot of people are all upset about the militia. All the militia is is concerned citizens that are worried about their constitution getting flushed down a toilet. We're not putting up with that stuff. We want people to understand that we love the constitution, we love our country, and we're not screwing around. All right, here we go. Generally, the militia shall be organized, equipped, and disciplined as provided by law. Now, let's get into that. A single section is substituted for all of this relating to the militia in the present 1908 Constitution. Remember I told you about empowering? The existing article ties the legislature down to an outmoded concept of what the militia should be. You believe that? Why our forefathers would be rolling over in their grave. Details as to organizing equipment and disciplining the militia are left to the legislative enactment in the interest of the flexibility and future requirements. Ah. Does that mean future requirements, if it got nasty and down and dirty, we would have our militia come back? Sounds good to me. I could go for that. The bottom line is the people that know what's going around are not screwing around. They join the militia. Okay? All right, now, Article 10. All right, here we go. Here we go, Article, Article 9. Let's pull this out. The militia... Organization and discipline. The legislature shall provide by law for organizing and disciplining the militia in such manner as they shall deem expedient not incompatible with the Constitution and the laws of the United States. But they're not doing it, right? The legislature shall provide for efficient discipline of the officers, commissioned and non-commissioned, and that musicians and or may provide by law for the organization and discipline of the volunteer companies. Volunteer companies. Notice that. Volunteer companies, huh? 
Officers of the militia shall be elected or appointed in such manner as the legislature shall from time to time direct and shall be commissioned by the governor. The governor shall have the power to call forth the militia to execute the laws of the state to suppress insurrections and repel invasions. That's what our forefathers had in mind when they had a militia. Now, if they're going to invade us, they're going to change our money, they're going to shut down our constitution. That's why the militia needs to be organized. That's why you need to be down there talking to a militia. That's why you need to be joining the militia. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care what color, national origin, ethnic background you come from. You need to be down to the militia, and you need to be talking to them folks about this is the United States of America, and I will protect it and its constitutional form of government. And by doing that, if we do it in sufficient numbers, most probably what will happen is the New World Order scammers will realize, ah, the people woke up, ah, we screwed up. We'll have to wait another 300 years to try and pull it again. And let's hope that's what happens. If that isn't what happens, then the militia will defend the republic, just like what our forefathers intended. And we will defend the republic, as we always do, with vigor. And we will have a government by constitution. That American flag will be on that pole out there, and anybody that wants to try something different, hey, knock yourself out. But planning a very severe battle because we will never give up the United States of America, its constitutional government, or our American flag, or our American heritage. So this idea that you're going to wear us out, tie us down, otherwise skew us around is nothing but a lot of who done. It ain't going to happen in your lifetime. As a matter of fact, your lifetime may not be that long either. <clears throat> because we try traitors in this country. And the bottom line is the penalty for treason is death. And it's not our purpose to threaten or coerce or otherwise intimidate any person, but we want you to understand that this is the United States of America, this is a country governed by constitutional law, that that constitutional law prescribed penalties for criminal acts, and that those criminal acts can be punished by a lawful means. We're asking all persons that are involved in all walks of government or there any areas of the law to please, 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 let's get back to the Constitution and quit screwing around. Let's just get back to what's supposed to be done and quit screwing around. Pull back your Federalist Papers and let's start reading. You're going to find out. Everything that's in this book is directly applicable today. We need to do it over. We need to get back to a gold and silver standard. We need to get back to a serious means of trade expedience that's going to hold the standards of our country even. We won't have this inflation. We won't have this ridiculous market situation. We're asking you, please, before God, we're asking you. We want our Constitution. We want it back. We want all of the American principles that we stand for, that our brave soldiers died for. And we're asking you to please quit screwing around. Let's get down to brass tacks. You, you've been feeding the pablum to the babies too long. We, we're way, believe me, we're way ahead of you. You may not think so, but I'm here to tell you, we're way ahead of you. You're going to wake up someday and you're going to be shocked. We're going to be all standing out there smiling. Because you're going to be the one that's asleep, not us. We know what we're talking about. We're not fooling around. We want you to honor our Constitution. God bless America. We want you to keep us safe. We want, to, we want to be into the 21st century stronger than we were in the 17th century. We're not fooling around, so please. Now, we can go into this book, and this book clearly establishes they never wanted to have a militia or a, or a standing army. They only trusted. You listen to some of these arguments in here. Okay. But it is said that the laws of the Union are to be the supreme law of the land. What inference can be drawn from this? Or what would, you, what would they amount to if they were not to be supreme? It is evident they would amount to nothing. A law by the very meaning of the term includes supremacy. It is the rule which those to whom it is prescribed are bound to observe. This results from every political association. If individuals enter into a state of society of laws of that society, must be the supreme regulator of their conduct. If a number of political societies enter into a larger political society, the laws which the latter may enact pursuant to the powers entrusted, entrusted 
to it by its constitution must necessarily be supreme over those societies and the individuals of whom they are comp composed of. It would otherwise be a mere treaty dependent on good faith of the parties and not a government which is only another word for a political power and supremacy. But it will not follow from this doctrine that acts of larger society which are not pursuant to its constitutional power but which are invasions of the residuary authorizes of the smaller societies will become the supreme law of the land. These will be merely acts of usurpation, which is kind of what's going on, and will deserve to be treated as such. Hence we perceive that the clause which declares the supremacy of the laws of the Union, like the one we, we have just before considered, only declares a truth which flows immediately and necessarily from the institution of the federal government. It will not. I presume, have escaped observation that it expressly confines the supremacy to laws made pursuant to the Constitution, which I mention merely as an instance of caution in the Convention, since the limitation would have been to be understood through, though it had not been expressed. Though a law, therefore, for laying a tax for a use of the United States would be supreme in its nature and could not legally be opposed or controlled, yet a law for abrogating and preventing the collection of a tax laid by the authority of the state, unless upon imports and exports, would not be the supreme law of the land, but an usurpation of power not granted by the Constitution, as far as an improper accumulation of taxes on the same object might tend to render the collection difficult or precarious. This would be a mutual inconvenience not arising from the superiority or defect of the power. Now we want to get into some serious arguments here. We want to go to page 108, about the middle of the page. Except as to the rule of apportionment, the United States have indefinite discretion to make requisitions for men and money. That means they can ask. But they have no authority to raise either by regulations extending to the individual citizens of America. That's why we don't have a Title 26 that applies to you. The consequences of this is that, though in theory their resolution concerning those objects are laws constitutionally binding on the members of the Union, yet in practice they are mere recommendations which the states observe or disregard at their option. This is the intent of the framers. Cohen versus Virginia, 6-2-1821, says this is the exact intent. Is it? pretty hard for you to understand what their intent was. They never intended to have an internal revenue, ever. They hated people that operated like that, that operated a tyranny against the people. All right, let's get on with this. Wise politicians will be cautious about fettering the government with restrictions that cannot be observed, because they know that every breach of the fundamental laws, though dictated by necessity, impairs that sacred reverence, which ought to be maintained in the breast of rulers towards the constitution of a country, and forms a precedent for other breaches where the same plea of necessity does not exist at all, or is less urgent and palpable, Publius. And it teaches us, in addition to the rest, how unequal parchment provisions are to struggle with public necessity. You know, I mean, you start reading. you got to read. Don't sit there like a bump on a log. Read. Get all kind of good stuff going here. I could, I could sit here and read this to you all night. This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary is notwithstanding. The indiscreet zeal of the adversaries to the Constitution has betrayed them into an attack on this part of it, as also without which it would have been evidently and radically defective. To be fully sensible of this, we need only suppose for a moment that the supremacy of the state's constitution had been left complete with a saving clause in their favor. In the first place, as these constitutions invest the state legislature with absolute sovereignty, in all cases not accepted but the existing Articles of Confederation, all the authorities contained in the proposed constitution, remember I told you about how they tied them together? So far as they exceed those enumerated in the confederation, would have been annulled. See that? And the new Congress would have been reduced to the same impotent condition with their predecessors. I mean, these people were wise way beyond their years. And this talks about the militia. They never wanted to have a standing army. Never. They always wanted the people to defend by a militia. 
They wanted the militia to be there ready to kick tail if there needed to be. They wanted to have a Paul Revere running down yelling, the British are coming, the British are coming, or whoever, somebody. They called them Minutemen. They call them Minutemen for a reason, because they wanted you to grab your kit and be out on the road in a minute, ready to kick tail and repel all borders. That's the way our forefathers thought. Now, they were wise men who had come from a, 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 a tyrannical environment in the European marketplaces. They knew exactly what was going on, and they weren't screwing around. And the bottom line is they were deadly serious, and they were ready to sign their life. Their, they pledged their life, their, their future, their, their fortunes, and everything so that we could have this Constitution. And I think we kind of owe them a debt because a lot of them died miserably as paupers because they dared to sign the Declaration of Independence and the king went after them with a vengeance. Do you understand? Now the bottom line here is we got a, we got a duty and we're going to finish this thing up. We want to do some stuff on taxes and then we're going we're to be out of here. We're going to do two things on taxes. One is going to be on Title 31 United States Code Section 742 and we're going to rattle it off. If you want the argument later you'll have to get back with us, okay? Title 31 United States Code and we're going to quote it. <coughs> except as otherwise provided by law. All stocks, bonds, treasury notes, and other obligations of the United States government shall be exempt from state, municipal, and local authority. This exemption extends to every form of taxation that would require either the obligations or the interest thereon, or both be considered directly or indirectly in the computation of the tax. See Memphis Bank versus State of Tennessee at L. Garner. Notice this is Memphis Bank versus State of Tennessee at L. Garner. Everybody got that? That's recorded at volume 459, U.S., page 392. Okay, right here. Right, can you see that? Okay. Now, what this case is, is this is a Supreme Court case that says that Title 31, United States Code, Section 742, is the supreme law of the land. And it does so on a diversity of tax arguments based on... Uh, discriminatory franchise of bond holdings, but basically what the Supreme Court said was Title 31, Section 742 was the supreme law of the land. And recorded right in here is exactly what I just quoted to you. Right here, except as otherwise provided by law. Notice it says all stocks, bonds, treasury notes, and other obligations of the United States shall be exempt from state taxation by or under state or municipal or local authority. Now what does this mean? What are they talking about here? This exemption extends to every form of taxation. That would require that either the obligations or the interest thereon or both be considered directly or indirectly in the computation of the tax. This is a unique tax argument. See, when the states went off the Article 1, Section 10, Gold and Silver Standard, you can't pay anyway because of Michigan Compile Laws Act 21.153. You cannot tender anything other than gold or silver coin to an officer of the government without being a party to a felony. On top of that, how do they figure the taxes? How do, let's look at our property taxes. This is a big issue. A lot of people get involved with this property taxes. They're tired of being taxed right out of their home. This tax <laughs> argument is specifically for you. They come to your house. They set a value on your house. They tell you that, oh, uh, your house is worth $100,000, so we're going to tax it at a 50% interest, which would be $50,000. That's a 50% amortization value. We'll figure your house is a $50,000 uh, bracket area, and then we're going to go seven points on that, 7%, uh, or whatever the percentage is. Now, stop for a second here. How did they figure the value on your house? Well, they said $50,000. There is no dollars. What dollars? You ain't got no dollars. You got dollars? I ain't got no dollars. Dollars of what? Dollars of coffee beans? I don't think so. The bottom line is they stay talking Federal Reserve notes, and they're putting the commodity item at the at the reserve notes. Now, what did they just do? Except it's otherwise provided by law. All oh, stocks, bonds, treasury notes. What is a, what is a Federal Reserve note? It's a treasury note. And other obligations of the United States. What what obligations? Title 12, Section 411 says the said notes shall be deemed to be obligations of the United States government. Whoops. Now wait a minute. Let's see, let's look at this again. Except as otherwise provided by law, all stocks, bonds, treasury notes, and other obligations of the United States shall be exempt from taxation by or under state or municipal or local authority. Does that mean they can't figure a tax by using obligations to the United States government? You're right. You're absolutely right. This exemption extends to every form of taxation that would require either the obligations or the interest thereon or both be considered directly or indirectly in the computation of the tax. Now, 
what are they doing when they figure this 50% amortization of value and then they add so many points percent on, and they attack that on and then they, they say, well, you owe us this much. Aren't they using Federal Reserve notes indirectly? They are, aren't they? And they're forbidden from doing that. And the Supreme Court says this is the supreme law of land. Well, guess what, folks? This case was originally brought in the matter of People versus Shepherd out of Lansing. <coughs> And after that case, they went in all the law books and they pulled out Title 31, Section 742. That's how scared they are of this title. And we went to Shepherd Citations and we noted that in Shepherd Citations, there was no note that says annulled, repe repealed, or otherwise transferred to some other law. There's a hole there, folks. It starts at, seven, it starts at Title 31, Section 734, and then there's a hole, and then it goes to 752. What happened here? They went in all the law books and pulled this argument out. Why do you think they did that? Because every state in the Union that went off the gold and silver standard under Article 1, Section 10 was locked out of the tax and the citizenry in any capacity by the use of obligations of the United States government. That's the only thing you got in your hand, folks. So rather than play that game, they went in all the law books and pulled it out. Then they went in shepherd citations, and instead of putting a note down there as to what happened, they just created a void. What is that evidence of? Fraud. Does not fraud void the contract? Last time I checked it did. Now I want you to pay attention to this stuff and get get locked in on this argument and don't try this until you've at least practiced a little bit. But anybody that's getting jammed on their property taxes or any other taxes for the state, lock their heels is all I got to say. Okay? Now we're going to go into one last argument on income taxes. <clears throat> And I'm not advising you as your attorney. I'm telling you what I have found as a scholar in the law books. I have found these arguments. And if you want to use them, that's your free choice. This is America. Last time I checked, you have a right under the Constitution. We've argued this before the Supreme Court, though, and it cannot be argued against. It's pretty strong. Bear with me a second here. My voice is going. Now, since the Constitution, all right, since the Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of the land, we got a unique argument here. It says in Article 1, Section 9, Paragraph 4, most clearly, no capitation or other direct tax shall be laid. Unless by the enumeration or addition here and before directed to be taken, and that's in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 2, which says income taxes and representation shall be by apportionment, which I will show you. I like to show everybody the rules. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 2. All right? Just so everybody's on the same wavelength. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 2. Where are we at here? Article 1, Section 2, Clause 2. Representatives and direct taxes shall be by apportionment among the several states which may be included within the Union according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding the whole number. All right, we got the idea. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 4. No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless by the proportion to the census or enumeration as here and before directed to be taken. Well, folks, they're not using the census. They're not using apportionment issue at all. They're evading it totally. Now, there's several arguments here, and it's very catchy, so I want you to pay close attention. All right? One of the arguments I want to share with you is brought by an infamous outstanding judge, Judge Beers. He's the gentleman that actually lived the movie Cheaper by the Dozen. He went out and had two wives and had 12 kids by each. Man's got a lot of guts. All them kids went to college, too, I want to tell you. Every one of them. I know some of them personally myself. One of them is the director of the law library at Oakland, Oakland uh, County Court. Excellent people. The Judge Beers got mad and he called up Jimmy Carter and he told him, look, we need to have a raise for our judges because we're not keeping up with inflation, etc., etc. And Jimmy told him, no way, Jose. And so Judge Beers filed in court the case of Evans versus Gore, recorded at 253 U.S. 245. Judge Evans sued I.R. Gore of the Internal Revenue Service because he claimed 
that the Internal Revenue Service diminished his salary during his continuance in office. And we all know that judges of the Supreme Court and Inferior Court shall hold their office during good behavior and shall receive for their services a valuable compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. That's Article 3, Paragraph 1. Wait, I'm sorry. Let's see. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, yeah, Article 3, Paragraph 1. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in the Supreme Court and such inferior courts as may from time to time ordain and establish. The judges both of the Supreme Court and inferior courts shall hold their office during good behavior and shall receive at stated times for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. Well, guess what, Your Honor? They diminished my salary during my continuance in office. You'll notice that there was no diminishment specified, so all diminishment is forbidden. Okay? And since all diminishment is forbidden, I am constitutionally immune from your income taxes. The Supreme Court came back and said, excellent argument. The 16th Amendment didn't create any new taxing power whatsoever. And clearly, Judge Evans is immune from income taxes, based on the Article 3, Paragraph 1, constitutional immunity. So up jumped the devil in the deep blue sea. Jimmy Carter was most unhappy, so he had to give the judges all a raise to shut him up. And he took his wrath out on Judge Beers, and he went and published the fact that Judge Beers was a bigamist, and he, he kind of trashed him and got him disbarred and thrown off the bench, which I didn't think was a very nice thing to do at all. Because Judge Beers was a good judge. Now, how does this affect you? Basically, this case of Evans versus Gore makes two basic statements. One, the 16th Amendment didn't create any new taxing power, and two, there was, what? An acceptable, possible immunity to the income tax, right? Whoa, I said. Let's go back to Article 1, Section 9, Paragraph 4. No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless by the rule of apportionment is here and before directed to be taken. Didn't I have a right to be free from a direct tax on my property? A direct tax is one where I actually come in your pocket and I tax it. I had a right to be free from a direct tax on my property unless by the rule of apportionment is here and before directed to be taken in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 2. Does that mean I'm constitutionally immune? It sure does. But you have to tell them and demand that it's a direct tax. you got to say it's a direct tax on my property. Now, what are they going to do? They're going to come around and tell you, this isn't under Title 26, this is under Title 27. And that really, you're a coal miner, or you're a miner of some kind, or you're a manufacturing handgun someplace. Well, you ask them, all right, let's see the Form 4456. They'll send you the Form 4456, and sure enough, they're going to have you down under some excise tax where they're charging you under BATF for having some fraudulent claim that you're involved in mining or something that re requires an excise tax and that for the privilege of doing business, you have to pay a fee because you're a corporation, an officer of a corporation, or you reside in the District of Columbia. Now, let's ask you. That's six, Section 6331A of the Code. Look up Section 6331A. Those are the only guys that the Treasury Department can levy against. That's the only ones. Are you any of those? No. How could that be? You're not any of those? They can't levy against you. If they can't levy against you, there's no jurisdiction over you. Got me? Does that make clear? I mean, if they could levy against you, they'd have jurisdiction. Now, if they levy against you and you pay them, guess what? You just gave them jurisdiction. You sign their documents, you sign their W-4 form, you don't put down there, like I told you, UD 1-207 without prejudice, guess what? You're in. So, you think. Now, isn't that fraud? Doesn't fraud void the contract? You need to read, folks. We need to get you down here, and we need to read. There's so many beautiful arguments in here. I mean, we can just hammer them. What is income? There is no income to find anywhere in the code. Oh, Section 61A of the code says uh, income is wages. No, it doesn't. It says Section 60, 61A of the code says this is a list of sources from which income could be derived. Not necessarily is be, but could be. Compensation. And it's compensation. Now, think about the word compensation. Look it up in Black's Law Dictionary. You're going to find out compensation to make whole. Now, if you're out there and you painted your neighbor's barn, and he told you he'd give you $300 by, by Christmas, all right? You painted the barn, and Christmas came, and he didn't pay you the $300. Wouldn't you have a loss on paper? You would, wouldn't you? And wouldn't you have a gain? He would, wouldn't he? 
Now let's say he pays you the three hundred dollars. What do you got? Do you have a loss? No. Do you, does he have a gain? No. What happened? An equal exchange of property. What happened? You changed your time of life property in labor for his consideration. You have a zero zero balance. You aren't ahead and he isn't behind. And you aren't behind and he isn't ahead. That is compensation. That's what it means. To make whole. Now, what happens if he doesn't pay you? Doesn't he have a gain? He would have a profit, wouldn't he? A realized profit or gain. He got you to work for him and he didn't pay you, right? And you would have a loss, right? Does that make sense to you? Now, the only way you would have the only way you would have income, by the way they define it, in Brushenburg versus Union Pacific and some of these other cases, Pollock versus Farmers Loan and Trust, first you would have to have a realized gain from some source, right? Before the period under consideration happened. Now, did you get paid any more than you agreed to? You didn't, did you? You got paid 300 You agreed to 300 you got 300 If you got $301, you had a gain. And if you were a corporation, an officer of a corporation, and a person that resided in the District of Columbia was an officer of the government, you'd have a income. But you're not any of those. You're not a corporation. You're not an officer of a corporation. You don't reside in the, in the District of Columbia as an officer of government. So you're, first of all, not even in the game. Second of all, you didn't receive any anything above what you bargained for. Okay. So you don't have a realized profit or gain before the period under consideration was commenced, so you don't have any income. What you have is compensation. Before it can become income, it would have to be corporate property. You'd have to be a corporation, and you'd have to have a realized profit or gain. You don't have that. So don't tell anybody you have income. You ain't got none. Every time you volunteer to get in that, you get in trouble. Don't volunteer. Didn't they tell you that in the Army? Don't volunteer. You volunteer, you get the broom, and you get to drive it around the floor. Just ask me, I'll tell you. I know. Now, the bottom line is this. There's a lot of things that you need to know. The biggest thing is that you need to get a hold of one of these books, and you need to read it cover to cover. And you need to be able to rattle it, just like I told you. And you need to trust your God in heaven above, in whom you should put all your trust and love. And you need to kick some tail and try and coordinate this program, format. You understand? Holy Bible? You got it? You need to get with the program. We can't keep screwing around like this, folks. You can't keep putting off till tomorrow. Because I'm going to tell you, there ain't going to be a tomorrow if you keep it up. You're going to have to get serious. Get hooked up on that radio station 5.065 WWCR. Go down to Radio Shack. Get one of them 20 dB gain amplifiers to plug into your radio so you can make the thing work better. Plug that thing into your external antenna. It runs on a 9-volt battery. Put a damn, uh, about a 3-inch strip of coiled uh, solder on the tip of the antenna. Go outside, throw your fishing rod over the, over the highest limb you can when the weight comes down. Take a roll of a uh, speaker wire, 100-foot speaker wire. You can get it at Radio Shack for 3 bucks, man. 3, 4 bucks. Bear the end, twist it together, tie it in a loop. Put it on the other end of that fishing line. Pull that fishing line up in the air. Get you a 100-foot antenna. Tie that baby off to your fence. Come outside and take that wire. Bear it off and take it into your house and wrap it around the antenna on that 20 dB gain amplifier. You can pick up Moscow just like WXYT radio down across the street. You got a 100-foot antenna. You put on that 20 dB gain amplifier and you're going to have your signal generating 20 times the force that it would before. So even if they jam the channel, you're still going to be able to hear, okay? You need to be listening to Radio Free America, to Jack McLam, to Tom Ballantyne, to, to uh, Bill Cooper, to Mark from Michigan. You know, you need to get in touch. You need to get in touch with your God. You need to get in touch with your fellow Americans. You need to get down to the militia. You need to quit screwing around, sitting on the couch, watching a ball game, and the life going by, and nothing's getting done. You understand? You need to get out there and hit a couple of these patriotic meetings and listen to some of these folks talking that are trying to save you and your country. And you need to start realizing that you need to put your money where your mouth is. It's like, you know, put up or shut up, because I'm telling you, if you don't do something soon, you're not going to have a country. 
what you're going to have is a chain around your ankle and you're going to be pissed. So I'm telling you, the time is now. You know, you want to be a son of liberty or a daughter of liberty, the time is now. Do not put off till tomorrow what you can do today because there won't be a tomorrow if you do. Just start putting one foot in front of the other, make up your mind you're going to do this, go get you one of these constitutions. And let's get serious business about America and let's bring her back to the way she was. We need to pull that baby back into the wind and take that ship out. Leave that flag flying high and we tell anybody to their to their face, you know, and we leave you to your proofs, pal. You touch my flag and God gonna get you tonight. Don't touch my flag. Don't touch my country. Don't touch my constitution. Now, I'm gonna wish you God bless America. We love you, America. I love Jack McLam's phrase, never to the New World Order. It'll never happen in your lifetime. you got to quit smoking that stuff. It ain't no good for you. You may think you're going to get away with it, but I'm here to tell you it ain't going to happen in your lifetime. You just keep wishing in one hand doing something in the other and see which one fills up faster. You're going to find out real quick. The United States of America is the most serious country in the world. Our people are the most generous, kind, and aggressive and I'm telling you, we love our country, we love our flag, we love our constitution, and we're not giving it up for anybody, especially a bunch of Yahoo bankers, okay? So, let them understand. Let the word go out and let them find out. We're not fooling around. So I'm going to wish you good night. God bless America. Long live the constitution. God bless all of the fine folks that are standing up and being counted. God bless all the fine soldiers that have given their very life and are still to this day giving their life. Now, come on, folks. Let's not fool around here. You go down there and you grab a hold of one of these congressmen and let them understand, hey, I don't care what about your Bill 666. You're not changing the Fourth Amendment. You're not doing nothing. You got that? You want to get elected next time? You better listen up, pal. We might even just charge you writing an open court of law with an open indictment for treason. Now, quit screwing around with my Constitution. Oh, I wanted to give that number out. We want to give that number out. We don't want to let that guy get away. We don't want to let that guy get away. Yes, sir. Let me get something here. Yes, yes, yes. Let me give you a number, folks. You need to call this congressman and let him understand. Say what? Say you're going to what? You'll be talking some heavy trash. We aren't going to fool around with you. Here. We aren't going to fool around with you. God bless America. Let me get this beauty out here. Now, you're going to get a treat. God's going to give you a treat tonight. This congressman's got this idea that we don't need the Fourth Amendment anymore. His name is Bill, or William, McCollum, spelled M-C-C-O-L-L-U-M. His phone number is area code 202-225-2176. He'd like to hear from you about the Fourth Amendment. You need to call him and tell him, do not touch my Constitution. Period. Do not change the Fourth Amendment, not even a little bit. We want our right to be free from an unreasonable search unless with a warrant, duly signed by a judge of the court, duly before a sworn magistrate where the guy swears that this is a true and fact case, this is the evidence to be seized, the person to be charged, and we want him to be able to hold that right up and say, we're not changing that today, sir. And if you got a problem with that, find another job, but you're fired. Got me?